Hi, I'm Liz. Welcome to Designing the Perfect Second Home. I'm going to introduce our first panelist, Mick DiGiulio. Mick DiGiulio is an internationally acclaimed designer um, renowned for his innovative kitchens and kitchen products. His residential work has been celebrated in leading design publications, um, and he has designed for many companies in the kitchen industry, including Callista, which is a Kohler company, the German company Cymatic, where his products have been bestsellers, and Sub-Zero Wolf Cove. Mick has designed numerous kitchens for companies, including the Chicago Tribune, Sub-Zero Wolf Cove, and uh, the Inspiration Studio at ABT Electronics in Glenview, Glenview, Illinois. Among his numerous accolades, uh, in 2012, he received the Kitchen of the Year Award from House Beautiful Magazine, and his design was showcased in Rockefeller Plaza. He has won the Sub-Zero Wolf Cove International Kitchen Design Contest multiple times and has received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. His new collection of light fixtures is coming out this year from Tech Lighting. Let's bring up Mick. Welcome, Mick. Thank you, Liz. Great to be here. Uh, so we're going to uh, talk about second homes. And, uh, you know, one thing I think about is first, second home or primary home, are they different? How do the clients think differently if they do? And how do I think differently in terms of the design and translating the client? So first thing I would say is, I think they definitely, clients think differently. They think they're more open to varying ideas, um, maybe a little, having a little bit more fun because it's a second home. And uh, they feel like they can maybe be more creative and really express themselves more in the secondary home. Primary homes, I think, tend to be a little bit more formal. And one of the ways that secondary homes uh, translate in design, especially with the ones I've worked on, are the, one, are the ideas that people are more informal and, and open. Uh, in the next slide, this shows a little bit of a, a shot of a concept that I had in this kitchen of having a little bit more fun and showing a farm table concept with a cooktop. So would I have done this in a primary home perhaps, but uh, the clients were very open to these kinds of alternative ideas. Uh, the next shot we see the next slide shows a much more spacious and open area. So I think people are, are open to the idea of being open and spacious. And for example, this is a foyer, but it actually uh, would be a multi-purpose area for being even a dining room because in this particular home, we did not design a formal dining room. So it's completely open and everything is movable and interchangeable. Uh, in the next slide, you can see how even stylistically people are more open to doing something like this, which is really a very different style, especially for this client. We had actually worked with this particular client in their primary home a few years earlier. And then when they did this home, uh, this style is completely different from what the first home was. So I think people are open to those kind of ideas. And when I say open, I think in two ways, open to ideas, but also open living in an open living plan is uh, much more acceptable because it's more informal. And I think people think of their second homes as being more informal. So second, uh, the next slide, I should say, is even showing that open idea in a master bedroom and master bath. So where we're standing, if we were the photographer, we're standing in the bed area, but you can see where there's furniture, you see the master bath, and you see the openness to even in the next shot, you'll see where the closet so the master closet was open to the bedroom, the master bath, and also the closet area. So a very alternative way of, of uh, thinking. And you know, I think a lot has to do with breaking down the barriers and being less compartmentalized, which I think is a general direction for design today, is that people 
like to be informal. They want to be comfortable. And part of that is translated into being more open. Uh, the next project in the next slide, we see a home. Again, I did a client's primary home a few years earlier, but when they built a second home, and this happens to be in the Hamptons in New York, uh, they were very open to the idea of an open plan. And the open plan being, you can see on the left side, you see a little bit of a fireplace and the soft seating and the idea that we're connected to the kitchen. Now, part of the challenge of doing these open plans, especially for kitchen planning, is we don't want the kitchens necessarily to look like the, sometimes the messy spaces that they can be when they're, they're being used. So in the next slide, you can see where we have now a, the kitchen and behind, you, so you can see left and right of where the cooktop area is under the hood, there are open areas where the small appliances are, are held, but those are actually able to be closed off from the main kitchen. And behind is actually a secondary kitchen, which we'll see a, a slide of in a second, but that's a way to get the idea of um, having a hidden area for doing the messier things. So that open area can always look clean and, uh, and more put away. This is a banquette that straddles both the out kitchen and the back kitchen. So if we look into the next slide, you see a little more of how that back kitchen area is. So it's a galley, but it's got all the things like cooktop and sink and refrigeration, microwave, and uh, they're able to entertain if they wanted from, from this area. And again, it straddled that banquette area, but it also straddled in the background. You can see where the ovens are. So you can access those ovens from both the out kitchen or main kitchen and the back kitchen. Uh, the next slide shows a little more of where a butler's pantry is. So sometimes we'll even do a jewel of an area that will look like it's uh, um, you know, not as informal, let's say, as the rest of the house. So having a little fun of mixing some of those ideas together. But that butler's pantry in the back that you can see to the far right uh, side of the screen is a very formal uh, area, but within kind of a, an informal space and open. The net effect that I found from do, working with clients, both primary and secondary homes, is they will sometimes think, the way that they think about their their secondary homes, why not go back and do their primary home in the same way? And doing things less of what they feel that they should be doing instead of how they can do things to design it to fit their lifestyle. If they gather with family and friends or they entertain in, in, uh, formally a lot, those lifestyles will dictate what the design is. And I think a lot of people too uh, design their secondary homes thinking that maybe someday these will be their primary homes and uh, design with that idea in mind. So that completes that part of the presentation. Liz, I'll go back to you. Thank you, Mick. Now I'm going to introduce Donna Fig. Donna is an interior designer based in Austin, Texas. She describes her firm's mission as bringing vitality to her clients' interior visions. With over 30 years of experience, she has led a variety of projects, including custom residences, second homes, multi-use development projects, country clubs, destination clubs, and hotels. In 2012, she established Donna Fig Design after 12 years of working as a director and project manager with a design firm near Vail, Colorado. Donna is affiliated with the American Society of Interior Designers, and her work has been honor, honored with numerous ASID awards. You can read more about the interiors that Donna designed for a Chicago area family's second home in Park City, Utah on spacesmag.com. I'll turn it over to Donna now. Thank you, Liz. Um, we're passionate about designing second homes. They are such a great place to bring your family together and spend meaningful time. 
the home serves as a base camp for the many activities you can share together. Uh, second home should be a place to rejuvenate and also serve as a landing pad. And there's really a lot of fundamentals we use when designing second homes. Um, a lot of these second homes are in resort areas. Um, overall, we like to create a vision or a concept that we carry throughout the residence, but not by repeating the same element over and over throughout the, the home, but by creating a different version of the vision throughout every space. So really the first kind of fundamental is do something unexpected. You know, go more modern like is shown in this slide here. Um, something you might not normally do. And then also maybe use a collection of objects in a wall that's on the, the following slide. Now this was an instance where we could, took some old antique skis, which can be a little hokey, but just kind of created it in a very visual, impactful way. So it became more of a graphic element instead of something kitschy. Um, there's a lot of new plumbing features out there where you can incorporate rain heads, steam showers, aromatherapy into the showers. So you have another very exciting experience in, in the baths that you wouldn't normally have at your primary residence. Um, also kind of a new look as well is on the following slide to use hanging pendants over the nightstands. And this was a way to just kind of bring in an organic, organic element. Also gives you some extra space on the nightstands, but just very creative use of, of lighting in a bedroom. Uh, another fundamental is really think about how you'll use the home. Are you gathering? Uh, do you like to play games? Maybe incorporate a game table into the family room. And then also on the next slide, homes, second homes especially, are very intergenerational. So considering how to incorporate the grandkids into like a great bunk room that can also serve teens as they get older. Um, and younger kids, so very multifunctional. There could be also instances where you need to think about grab bars or kind of wider doors for um, visitors that either have some mobility challenges or um, might have injuries as well. Also, kind of look at the outdoor spaces because those become so important in second homes. You gather around a fire pit, have a hot tub, and there can be many outdoor living spaces. And in this slide here, we focus on comfort, balancing the look of true comfort with flexibility, where you can pull out an ottoman and then expand it to a sleeper sofa. And then the ottoman also you can move the cocktail table around so you can just kick your feet up and it becomes a really relaxed environment. And another kind of very important fundamental is to have fun. You know, bring in the surroundings and a sense of the region to this second home. And the, the next slide, we use wall murals throughout the home. And this was the, one of the images used in the Spaces article, where it's just kind of a fun, you know, use of bringing in a bear to this mountain home. Um, and of course, create visual elements throughout the home. You can create little cozy notes for reading, a zen reading area. Um, you can have fun with unique fireplace treatments. They don't always have to be the house stone. You can do slabs or incorporate metal elements as well. And in the next slide, it indicates kind of plays on patterns and a lot of textures that you can use together, like this fun tile used on the backdrop of this bar area. And I would just say to kind of wrap it up that it's, don't go it alone. It's, uh, it's really advantageous to hire a team of professionals that can help you realize your vision. You know, experience, they have experiences with what doesn't work and what does work. 
and they have a lot of unlimited resources as well. And just getting that whole team on board can just make everything go a lot smoother. And it's a fun collaborative process as well. As one client told us, you get all the great minds together for the biggest success. So I'll take it back to you, Liz. Next up, we have Jeff Hadley. Jeff is the Vice President and General Manager of Hadley General Contractors in Marin County, California. His family has been in the construction business for three generations. His father has joked that construction is a genetic disorder that runs in their family. Before happily returning to the family business in 2018, Jeff worked in commercial contracting and he was involved in developing a 300 site luxury RV resort in Paso Robles. The Hadley family established their company in 1950 in Belvedere, California. They have always specialized in high-end custom home remodeling and new construction, and they're well known for their attention to detail, their concierge style customer service, and for always standing by their work. They call all of this the Hadley way. Jeff plans to continue running the company with the same values as the prior two generations while implementing modern technologies to increase efficiency. Thanks for being here, Jeff. I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Liz. And um, thank you everybody else who joined on today's call. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, join us on this discussion. I think um, Mick and Donna have brought up some excellent uh, points about design and I definitely want to piggyback off of Mick's point that uh, you know, what we're seeing in the industry is that clients really do enjoy having fun uh, with their second home as opposed to a primary residence. Um, I think it is multiple reasons. One is it gives them the ability to be expressive with maybe out having to uh, be as formal as you'd want with the primary residence. But there are also spaces that are designed for entertaining and um, you know, hopefully having the whole family and friends out um, on a very frequent basis. Um, so we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, open floor concepts, um, especially on the houses that are on the water or uh, are built in locations that give them great views. Uh, we're seeing a large open uh, concept with large window walls and um, the kitchen, the dining room, the living room, all kind of being oriented to that view and uh, wanting it to be opened up. So, so as you can see on this slide here, which will uh, stick around for a little while on, um, what I'm, what I'm gonna bring to the table is a little bit of a different perspective. Um, we are not a design build firm. We are, we are strictly just builders um, and we do really enjoy our relationships with our design teams. Um, and Donna brought up a great point about organizing a team of professionals. Um, and the, the key point to that is the team atmosphere. As she said, when you have many minds in the same room working on a, a one goal, you're going to come out with a better outcome, um, a higher quality outcome than if, if everybody's uh, kind of pigeonholed with their own interests. So, so we always encourage our clients uh, to start early with the full team. Um, that would include, depending on the project, uh, obviously their architects and their main designers. Um, but also starting to develop that team of structural engineers, uh, geotechnical engineers, contractors, um, and even key subcontractors. So we try to bring all that to the table very early on. Uh, we find having that collaborative approach to uh, the project development uh, is really key in A, saving the clients a lot of money in the long run, but also making sure all expectations are set early on. Um, one of the points of topics I'd like to discuss today is you know, starting with the budget in mind, um, we see a lot of clients that um, we might have the initial meeting with and they explain to us what their overall goals are. We would recommend a few architects for them to start with. And then, you know, the project goes away from us for uh, sometimes a year or two, depending on how long the, the design phase is on it. And what comes back is something that is very obviously far outside of the, of the client's budget for what they wanted to start with in the first place. So I always encourage clients when they're starting to start with a conceptual design with architects, um, designers, and uh, and then have the engineers and the contractors and the people who are actually going to be doing the work look at those concept drawings, um, and and we can very easily kind of uh, 
determine the scale of the project as well as large costs. And then at that point, we can recommend maybe some changes or some value engineering ideas that can be done prior to the designers and the architects finishing the plans. Um, historically in construction, especially in residential, has been the what I would call the design bid build model. You, you go and you have the project designed, then you send it out to multiple contractors to bid on it. You select the bidder, um, sometimes off of cost, sometimes off of qualifications, uh, whatever it is, you choose that, that builder, and then you start construction. Uh, the, the inherent flaw I see on that is, uh, you know, A, you're fully committed to the design when uh, you haven't had any input on costs. So you go through the entire design process or a large portion of the design process without having any input from the people who will be building it on costs. So that I've seen lead a lot of people down. I don't want to say necessarily the wrong path because I think the architects and the designers do a great job and they have a real vision of, of what the house can become, but it also is balancing it with the clients once and then also their resources. So by, by starting with a conceptual drawing, you have low input from both the architect side and from the client side on the cost of those drawings. Um, and then looking at the con conceptual drawings, we'll know, okay, here are some high, high price items that you're asking for, and maybe here are some ways around it. Um, in this slide, you can see this, this large window wall. This was a remodel, um, which is also something that should be considered by, by any client who's looking to do a, a, a new build, whether it's for a primary residence or for a secondary home, is do you go remodel or do you go new construction? Um, we could talk hours on that topic alone, um, and it's really gonna be project specific, so I'm not gonna go too far into it. But, but this project here was a remodel. Um, the design team did a fantastic job of, of completely altering the space. If, if we had been standing in this house before the remodel, when this photo was taken in the same location, you'd be looking at a chimney in the middle of the room with a fireplace right in front of you. And then the back wall was a standard layout of, of windows and a sliding glass door. So they really weren't capitalizing on the view. And behind us in this picture is the kitchen and the living room. So what the designers did, and I think they, again, they did a fantastic job is they, they eliminated the fireplace altogether and then had us install this um, large multi-slide door. This is a 24 foot span. So there's, there's four six foot panels, just to give you an idea of scale. Now, the reason I bring this up uh, is whenever you're doing a remodel, uh, you have to work with existing conditions. And, and nowadays with this trend going towards these large, either multi-slide or bifold doors or window walls, um, there's a lot of consideration that needs to go into the structure of the house. And that's where we actually see the costs really impact the project. And it, it's something that I like to bring up early to clients because there are alternatives. But it's also something to consider, um, you know, the, the cost to the value. And I always um, tell clients, you know, that you always have to look at the cost of the work versus the value it's producing. And that can be value as a resale or value at, intrinsically. And some clients have some things that they, they want inherently. Or it's, it's high on their list um, and they're willing to pay for it. But other options are more uh, flexible and, and there can be cost savings found. Um, so, so. In this picture, as you can see, the, the large door opening required a steel header over the top of it. Um, so what we had to do is go in and actually remove everything, demo that corner of the house essentially, and then install a steel header and then steel posts down each side. And that's just the, the top part. What, what we really see add costs are when the either the geotech or the structural in conjunction with the geotech spec out additional footings um, to support the load because now you're taking a span that maybe had several points of load and, or bearing underneath it and putting it on two points of bearing. So you're increasing that point load on both sides of the door, um, which sometimes would require, uh, uh, I would say, you know, not a technical term, but beefed up footings. And, and that can add a lot of work because now we're, we're working underneath the house um, with existing conditions, around existing conditions, trying to pour new footings. Um, so, so that would go back to the topic of a remodel versus new construction, which again kind of circles back to the the overall concept of making sure you're you're developing that whole team early so these conversations can be had. Um, as we move to the next slide, you can see another option of a large window wall. Um, I just included this one again because it shows uh, that there are several options when you do want to do a window wall, whether it's a, a multi slider or a bifold or a system like this, which is. Uh, essentially just two, it's a very large sliding glass door. It's a steel frame glass. It, it's a very beautiful product. Um, 
but again, it requires a large span. Now this was a new construction project. So it, it, it really was not too large of an ad or any difficulty to have that large span because we knew it was coming from the beginning. So we, as we were doing the footings and the, this house is actually on a slab as we were doing the slab and the grade beams of the footings, um, it was all planned. So it wasn't a lot of additional work to have that included. So that, that's something that can be considered again, very early on in the design process. Um, as we go to the next slide, I wanted to include this one because you can see an option where the clients actually did were able to capture uh, in some sense, a large window wall um, and really capitalize on their views, but they did it in a manner that did not require a large beam over the top. Um, also, this house itself uh, was like this when we remodeled it. So uh, as far as a code upgrade uh, standpoint, we were just replacing in kind. So it made it the permitting process much easier. So all things to consider and also reasons I think it's uh, important to have both the contractor and I would recommend a further design team people such as structural engineers, geotechnical engineers, um, along with the architect and the designer. And I would recommend getting meetings either on site or um, at least around a table early on so you can hash out some of these larger details uh, before spending the money with uh, architects and engineers to do all the engineering work just for us to be able to tell you that it's, uh, it would be an expensive ad. Um, going on to this next slide i can show you um this is the same house with the uh, you can see the the doors now on the left one thing i wanted to bring up with this which is another point we hear all the time especially with uh, a trend we're seeing which is kind of a minimalistic style of trim and details this house if you look closely actually has no trim it has no window trim door trim um, all the doors are actually pivot doors um, so they do not lock or close and there's no hardware on them a lot of people would look at this uh, maybe without an untrained eye and say, oh, well, that's great. It's easy. You don't have any of the trim cost. That's actually far from the truth. It's actually much more difficult to build a house. Uh, these, all these walls and ceilings are plaster. And um, prior to finishing that final coat of plaster, because that is the final product. Uh, on most cases, trim allows us to install doors um, later on uh, with the drywall and, and the buildup. I won't go too far into the technical details on that. but Point being is that what might seem from a design standpoint as um, easier or cheaper can be quite the contrary. And I, I know the architects and designers in the industry understand it, but it's something that uh, you know I feel that clients should be aware of as well. Um, and then finally, as we go uh, to this, I think I have two more slides. This next one is going to be a picture of um, a project we finished. We saw this one. It's actually the one we started with. And something to bring up to this, this specific picture here is this door is an in-swing door. Um, being that this window here is facing the coast, we were always concerned with the, uh, the weather, um, the possible for future leaks on, on heavy storm surges or uh, very intense winds. So we, we opted um, with the permission of the client to spend a little extra money and we actually waterproofed the entire entryway as if it was a shower pan. Um, so in the future that or in the future, if there is an event where there's a strong storm uh, forcing wind driven rain into this door or into these windows, um, there may be a puddle in the house, but it's not going to cause significant damage. Um, something to be considered as well as uh, in this door, it, it probably wasn't the right option to go with. Um, we would we as a builder would much prefer to see an outswing door uh, because of the, the waterproofing characteristics are, are better in our opinion. But it goes back to being a team player and a collaborative approach and, and balancing the wants, the wants of the owners, um, the wants of the architects and the design team, and then also the wants of the contractor to, to come up with a, with a solution. So that's how we were able to give the clients and the architects what they wanted with this door, but also feel that we were providing a product that wouldn't be susceptible to damage in the future. Um, one last thing I'd like to talk about as well, uh, as far as the wants and the needs of a client, um, I highly recommend clients to to prioritize a list of, of their wants um, and also any needs that they know of and the needs that we see on site um, as, as a professional, whether that's an architect or a contractor engineer looking at the house. Um, we have it a lot where and we're called out to add, let's make an example of a large window wall. Um, in the client's mind, that's what they want. But what we have to see is, okay, what kind of impacts are these going to have? And then furthermore, what kind of impact are the once going to trigger? And, and that's where we see the scope creep or the snowball effect happen very quickly. And again, that's why I encourage all um, anybody part, uh, starting off on a large project to uh, incorporate 
different perspectives uh, into the initial meetings. And sometimes a lot of things can be hashed out very early on and you can kind of define your roadmap before uh, making a large investment in drawings and uh, design. And um, that way all expectations are on the same page from the very beginning. And we as a builder can also make specific recommendations that might be cost saving as far as um, construction feasibility and et cetera. Um, on this last slide, we'll, we'll loop back to the overall picture of the house. So two things I wanted to point out um, on this house specifically that I'm sure we're not in the original design um, intent for the owner is you'll notice the, the, the building in the furthest back, the primary residence is actually two stories. Well, the first story of that is all um, actually elevated only due to FEMA regulations um, and with the intended sea level rise and being that it's on the coast. So that entire lower floor of that house is actually not, uh, per code, is not inhabitable space. Um, it's all built up on a steel frame. Again, this was a new construction project, so it's, it's something that could be incorporated into the overall design fairly easily and actually did afford the owner uh, a lot of great storage space. Um, however, that entire uh, lower floor of that back house is designed uh, with breakaway walls. So if there ever is a storm surge, it's designed to have that lower floor. Uh, the walls will break away and the storm surge will flow uh, below the house instead of damaging the actual structure above where all your finishes and a lot of the costs are associated with. Now, the building in the front is the garage and then in between the two is a guest house. Those buildings actually lie just outside the FEMA line. So they were not um, required by code to be elevated for living space. Um, so just an interesting thing to consider. Uh, the point that I'm making here is make sure to work with um, a team. Uh, somebody on the team should be uh, familiar with the local area and local jurisdictions, um, as well as potential impacts of regulations that would impact a house like this, but would not impact a house on the other side of the street that is just a little farther away from the coast. So, um, so all things to consider, and again, I think that the takeaway message is to make sure that, um, as Donna mentioned, uh, assemble that team of professionals um, and, and hash out a lot of these questions early on in the project and um, uh, really work together. A, a team approach is always going to be the best way to a, a successful project. And um, ag again, having many uh, different minds and perspectives in the same room will, will create a higher quality product, in my opinion. So um, I'll pass it back to Liz and uh, thank you everybody again for your time. Thank you, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I was just reading a few headlines this morning about second homes um, that, you know, since the pandemic hit, basically last year, everyone decided that they needed a second home if they didn't already have one. The demand has been huge. Um, so I wanted to ask you all, um, how do you think, obviously the pandemic has increased the demand for second homes. Do you think that's going to continue or how do you see people thinking about their second homes or treating their second homes in the future? Now people are spending half of their year there. Um, yeah. How is it, how has the pandemic affected how people are thinking about second homes? You know, Liz, I think uh, what I could see is it really relates to a bigger uh, picture in terms of thought and the idea that people, it was a time for people to reevaluate their lives and think about what's important to them. And if they're going to be doing things, when will they want to do it? Sometimes, you know, the pandemic, I think, gave everybody the sense that nothing is for sure, nothing is permanent. And if you're going to be doing something, uh, consider doing it sooner than later. Oh, Donna, I think you're you're muted. Make sure you're in your microphone. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we're also seeing our clients wanting to leave the city and spend more time out in these um, kind of more relaxed areas, resort areas. Um, and that's, they're spending more time out there too, to be able to spend with their families and their friends. Um, and there's also more availability to do things online where they can do some of their online schoolwork for the kids. And so you're in, looking at incorporating desk into spaces now and um, 
So we don't see it slowing down. I think more and more people are focused on that need to spend more quality time together. I would agree with both Mick and Donna. I mean, we're, we're, they brought up uh, both uh, good points. We're seeing with our clients, a lot of people leaving the city and, and coming up into Marin and uh, buying new homes there. So they're, whether they're making it their primary residence, uh, just relocating or they're, they're buying a second home to be a little further, further distance from people. Um, they're going through and they're doing a lot of facelifts when they, when they purchase an older home. For clients that already have second homes, uh, we're, what we're seeing uh, to the two most often projects we see are um, home offices conversion, whether that's a basement or a garage conversion to a home office, uh, as well as gyms. Uh, a lot of people would like that gym at home. Uh, so we're seeing that as kind of the two big keys. And, and whether it's a basement conversion or a garage conversion or an addition, I say that those are the three most common places that are people are finding to put those spaces. Well, that brings me to another question, which is because um, I think some of the, the photos we looked at, you know, there were these big spacious homes, but then some people have second homes that are um, really not huge spaces like studio apartment in, in Manhattan or something um, just to spend depends where you want to spend your time. So if it's a more modest space, what have you seen um, being done to repurpose spaces um, and use them in different ways? Well, I think, uh, Liz, if I could jump in, the idea of um, multi-purpose spaces, uh, the idea of moving, being able to move furniture and, uh, as I said in my presentation, doing uh, turning a foyer into a dining room and uh, creating spaces that are just have more flexibility, I think is what uh, people are looking for. And uh, like you're saying about the size, you know, I had somebody say to me the other day, you know, we have an 8,300 square foot home. Uh, we don't want a, another 8,300 square foot home that we need to take care of. And uh, what they're going to be doing is building something in the range of three to 4,000 square feet still will have three bedrooms and, but it's really scaled back to where they want to be in terms of comfort. And, uh, and, and a lot has to do with the maintenance of, uh, of not having those same kinds of uh, things hanging over their head. I agree. And to, to Nick's point, kind of incorporating multi-use spaces like taking an island and using that as your dining area for like say condos um, where you can have both functions um, and then also we're seeing a lot of maybe just one living space where you don't need two because people want to spend more time together as a family anyway so that's one way to be a little bit more efficient with the space for kind of smaller um, residences yeah, and, and we've seen as well um, a combination of rooms. They may take a large a large bedroom or a large great room and divide it into an office and a bedroom um, or, or kind of reorganizing a spaces within the house and then also using things uh, like maybe an entertainment room or a home theater room and splitting it and not, not with the partition, but so much as just realigning the space with like a shared office office slash entertainment um, room. So kind of just reallocating the space within the house and, and seeing how it works best for the family. And also then when it comes to, uh, Nick mentioned, um, some people are opting for a smaller second home. Um, and I know people are now more aware of, of their footprint and their carbon footprint. What are you seeing in terms of people uh, investing in second homes, but wanting them to have um, green features, if you will. I think for a lot of people, green has become just a way of life. Uh, there's less talk about it in a way, but I think it's built into people's lifestyles and on people's minds all the time. So um, they relate well to suggestions about what it will mean to be green in terms of you know, the lifestyle and the carbon footprint and what they're, uh, the statement they're making. So I think it is, it's now firmly ingrained in people's lives. 
Good point. It's a very friend of mine. And, you know, there's a lot of energy sources that are renewable um, that comes into play during construction, too, uh, that are really impactful as far as the overall design and um, how to be green with the living spaces. Um, those make a, a huge difference. But there's also other things you can do as far as, like, some people are concerned about the materials, too. That they just want organic cotton, um, you know, things that their family touches and and feel on a day to day basis. Um, so those are very important to I think everyone overall. Yeah, and we're we're seeing so we're lucky. Or I should say we're I say we're lucky. It's um in, in my opinion, uh, you know. I'm proud to be in California, which has very strict um, environmental regulations as far as energy usage. Title 24 of the California Building Code is all about energy regulations uh, and how and the efficiencies of the homes. So one one common, I'll be a little bit of a pessimist here, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I see it all the time where people start with green building and want these tactics and want these great things, and then they see the cost impact to their project on it. And usually it's one of the first things to be eliminated. Um, again, it's, it goes back to that cost versus value, and are you doing it for intrinsic value, or are you doing it for um, you know moral value of, of building an efficient home or environmental uh, impact of the home, um, or at the end of the day, are you going to prioritize what you want versus uh, the cost? So um, it's, I hate to be a bit of a pessimist on it, but we do see a lot of the green techniques, I should say techniques, green building techniques are implemented. Um, however, green specific like lead accreditations uh, for custom homes is fairly rare uh, due to the cost. Um, uh, so, so we do have an impact on that front. California itself, uh, again, with a Title 24, um, inherently our, our homes are, are being built uh, quite green. Uh, solar is required on any new structure. So all, all new homes have solar on them. Um, the Title 24, as far as it relates to energy efficiency with windows, um, very efficient use of windows and space, which can be a bit of a dilemma when you're remodeling a home. Uh, you have to balance if you want to add, if you want to take a wall that used to be six inches thick and have insulation in it and make it all glass, there's going to be a balance of that energy usage within the house. So you might have to either eliminate other windows or openings, or for example, if you have a home full of single pane or even double pane older windows that are not as efficient, and you want to add a large window wall, then you may end up having to replace all the windows in the house to make them more efficient so that the overall balance or the net change and efficiency of that house is not lost when you add that much more heat loss through a large window wall. So um, so, so there are, the people do prioritize it, uh, there's no doubt, uh, but I do think um, when it comes to custom homes, especially, it is uh, usually one of the things that's eliminated from the budget fairly early on, if it's a big, big matter. But again, in California, we have our hands tied, for lack of a better term, um, on what we can and can't do. So inherently, our homes are fairly efficient. Great. Another thing I wanted to ask um, that Donna got into a little bit, she talked about like um, having just unexpected um, or particularly luxurious features, um, you know, like a beautiful steam shower, aromatherapy, things like that. What else? Because I always think about a second home being, I'm getting my family together. I want to entertain guests there. What features do you like to incorporate for comfort and welcome? Well, a lot of secondary homes, second homes are uh, they're in great places, right? They're compared to Chicago, especially where we're based. Uh, people, you know, maybe in California or do a second home in Florida, but uh, or the Carolinas, beautiful places, warmer climates. And one of the things I see is the importance of inside outside. So bringing the outside into the home, large uh, panes of glass and abilities to view the exterior, and also some outdoor kitchen ability, especially someone who comes from Chicago wanting to do something that they can do that grill and the pizza oven, and they can do something on the exterior a little bit more uh, extravagant and year round than they could do it in Chicago. So sometimes it has to do with uh, locale. 
Absolutely, and also some other kind of important comfort features are incorporating different types of lounge furnishings. So we're seeing a trend towards even using chaise lounges um, instead of like a love seat or a sofa, we use a, a, a chaise that's a little bit more relaxed feeling. Um, that's kind of a new trend that we're seeing. Um, of course, I mentioned the showers, bathrooms, especially for masters can be just um, almost like even better than hotel features because you can choose body sprays and steam showers and kind of have the whole gamut there. Um, and also I think bars are important features, which is another form of entertainment in the home. Um, so you can have those outdoor as well as indoor. Uh, built-in coffee makers as well. Um, and like Nick mentioned, the um, um, butler's pantries too that are just really important as another kind of hidden away space that they can use for some of those important items that they want like coffee makers and toasters and such. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add to that is um, it kind of ties back into the point of them having more fun with their second homes, too. Uh, the, the design is a little more free, I would I would think. And again, we're on the latter end of this. Um, but I know what our clients really appreciate are, are things like warm floors, um, whether that's a radiant system or an electronic system in the bathrooms. I would highly recommend it, at least in the master bath, um, if nowhere else. Um, but throughout the house, um, it can be especially if it's used uh, as a supplement to a forced air system, uh, you kind of get both of that, the, excuse me, best of both worlds with that in the sense that the forced air provides that instant heat for the air, but you can also have the, the warm floors where you're walking around in your socks or barefoot. If you're in and out of the house, um, it, it just creates a little more of a, a warmer feeling um, literally within the house. And then also with colors on the floors, I've seen that make a huge feeling of, a, a change in feeling of if it's a if it feels more of a professional space or more of a warm cozy space or a clean space with white floors so um i think the the floors have a huge impact on on how the overall house the, the warmth of the house feels and, and a great opportunity to create a little bit of extra um com you know creature comforts for lack of a better term and lighting is huge too in homes so if you're remodeling a house um i would i would highly recommend looking at the lighting plan and seeing how that can be flexed to really change the space or at least um, highlight or low light other spaces to make it feel either more modern or more comfortable or cozy or or brighter or whatever is necessary yeah and i think it's you know jeff and and don i agree you know that it, it all comes down to a certain feeling of indulgence that people want in the second home and able to do some of these things that uh, you spoke about, uh, you know, this is the time to do it. So they're more open to those ideas to uh, put those things in that they really want and maybe have wanted for longer amounts of time. And uh, now they can do it. And along with Jeff's point about kind of the in-floor radiant heat too, we're seeing a lot of people wanting the heaters outdoors that are built in you know, and, and solar screens or screens for bugs as well. Keep those out, just extra creature comforts. Yeah, de definitely, Donna. It's funny, I was thinking about that in my head too. Well, the point of this is all the outdoor heaters. We see that all the time with this new outdoor indoor space concept with the big window walls. Um, that the slide that I showed that house, one of the things it was, was add the window wall and add heaters on the outside. So when you go indoor, outdoor space, if you're dining outside or inside, it, um, it makes that shock less, especially here on the Bay where we get the fog and we get that cool coastal breeze in the evenings. It mm -hmm. um, definitely makes a nice space. You know, one, one important part of, I think, a second home too, Liz and, and uh, Donna and Jeff is, you know, the process of doing a second home, right? Because the second homes are typically not in someone's backyard. Let's say someone lives in Chicago and they're building a home in California or they're doing something in Florida, Colorado, wherever. So they're not working with the people that they typically know uh, sometimes. Now they'll probably need to work with a, a local contractor, for example. We're, we happen to be working actually with, with uh, Jeff and Hadley Construction in a project in, uh, in Marin, in Tiburon. And, um, you know, it, 
First, I want to give you a little commercial here, Jeff, because you guys are phenomenal <laughs> to work with, really. I mean, you're so responsive and all the all the things that you talked about and Donna talked about, but bringing that team together, you guys walk the walk. I mean, um, we feel like we're doing a project right in our own backyard because when we call you or we send an email asking questions, uh, handling things at the site, you guys are like we're right down the block from each other. So it's really important. And Donna talked about that idea of you know, bringing that team together that can execute and uh, work well together and getting all of these professionals together. And, you know, that that is one good example. But I think process is a really, really important part of that second home. You know, that that ability to connect from Chicago to California or wherever, having a team that you can depend upon and make sure that people are working together and, and execute it just like it's in your own backyard. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you, Mick. I, I'm going to owe you lunch next time I'm out in Chicago. <laughs> um, no, I couldn't agree with Mick uh, more. And, and I think one of the you know silver linings of this pandemic has been people have become much more comfortable with um, virtual meetings or Zoom meetings or or being that response. You know, we can we can get Mick on a FaceTime if we need to to look at details or his team to look at details for us or um, send measurements back and forth uh, very easily with with technology. So it has been extremely helpful to have that um, that technology increase and, and using some tools that kind of try to keep everybody um, informed in real time. Um, and and Mick, I'll, I'll, I'll send it back to you as well. It's been fantastic to work with you and your team. And um, I think such a huge part of construction projects in general, um, including the client interface is all about communication. So um, finding people and finding that team that are all good communicators and, and are on top of it is key for uh, when clients are looking for a team. I would definitely prioritize communication. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Well, I want to make sure we have time for some questions from the audience. Um, one person asked, um, "What? how is a, a retirement home different from a second home um, in terms of design? Uh, Donna, go ahead. All right. Um, I think some things to consider are closet space. Because in second homes, you don't uh, necessarily need very large closets, but for a retirement home or something that you're going to spend your time in full time, you definitely need to allow for closet space. So I would also say kitchens are really important. If you want to have all the features that you need for a good kitchen, you can get away with something a little bit smaller in a second home, um, but having just kitchens with all the amenities, maybe two dishwashers, uh, depending on the size. You know, some of those things are very important as well. Um, outdoor living spaces, also critical. Um, and then also considering if it's aging in place as well, allowing for wider doors for whatever might happen in the future. Um, even ski injuries or you know, whatever might happen, grab bars, there's assist bars at the toilet, just some of those things that can be very practical and can also look good if they're thought out. So those are just a few items to consider. Yeah, good point, Don, especially on that accessibility, you know, uh, doing, making sure showers are easier to get into for people, um, master bedrooms and master suites on the main floor. Um, easier living that way, and uh, and also low maintenance. You know that people, by the time they're hitting a retirement home, they they know the kind of ridges and grooves and the kind of things that uh, it can take more maintenance in terms of cleaning. Jeff, you touched on the trim. You know, especially trimless homes. Uh, that's kind of part of that. You know, more simplified kind of design and in a lot of ways more simple to take care of too. So I think people are looking for that ease of ease of care, ease of maintenance. Yeah, I think I think Mick, you and Don uh, hit the nail on the head on that one. Um, and the only thing I was gonna say in addition, and it's already been brought up is curbless showers are a very common thing we see. Also, um, if you have, a, if you're looking at remodeling or buying a, a two-story home, consider an elevator. 
um, which can be added on um, or reconfigured interior space to um, make it work. Um, or, or just keep your search to a single story home which would probably be my recommendation, especially if you're heading to the retirement age. Okay, great. Another person asked, um, we talked about it maybe a little um, about home offices um, during the pandemic, people are working remotely. Um, where have you seen them being incorporated? Um, oh, sorry, sorry, Mick. real quick. The, the, the most common places we see, um, especially last year where it was more of a critical people calling us because they needed the space to use, uh, was typically a, a garage conversion or a basement conversion. We build out a basement space underneath the house. Um, a lot of those sites we work on here in Marin are on hillsides. So it's not like excavating out underneath a, a house on a, a flat lot. Um, but we were able to capture, recapture some of that space that was underneath the house as a crawl space uh, previously. Um, or reallocating a bedroom as an office is, is where we're seeing it. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. also seeing... Um, two people sharing an office space. So maybe kind of like a partner's desk or two different kind of desk areas within one space. Um, also an area right off the kitchen. You, there used to always be kind of a desk within the kitchen that's pretty much gone away, but even kind of a separate area tucked off right off the kitchen as well is uh, some trends that we're seeing as well. More open living, less compartmentalized living, and um, which enables people to do more functions and change things around if they want. But why not be open? And it all it all goes back to being much more informal about uh, lifestyles today. We're we're seeing some clients ask for, uh, for example, I can think of one where they took the large room and, and split into two offices. Uh, one specific request was um, uh, the design of a sound deadening wall in between the two offices. Uh, the, the work that this client did was fairly classified. So even though it was his wife, he couldn't have her hearing the phone conversations he was having. So that was a, a design criteria for that, which um, you know, with, depending on your space, uh, the space available within the wall can be difficult. Um, and then the same in the same breath, th those same two offices were designed with Murphy beds in them. So they could when they had family in town, they could drop down the Murphy beds and use it as a bedroom, but otherwise it was an office and it was an elegant design with the cabinetry. So I think a Murphy bed is always a great option for an office. Great. It makes me think, Jeff, of a client I have. You talked about having the confidential uh, wall in between. My client wanted the wall in between because she said her husband was way too loud. <laughs> We've done snoring rooms before where it's a whole other bedroom just because of the, the amount the, the, the person snores. So <laughs> yeah, it's a future comfort. I was going to say, we think about second homes as gathering spaces, but on the other hand, some of us want to be away from our, our loved ones, have a little more space um, yeah. after this past year and a half. Um, well, thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists. This has just been so edifying. So thanks for joining us. Um, I am going to turn it over to Sharon. Back to Sharon. Pleasure. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That was such a great discussion. Thank you for facilitating that. This is all the time we have for today. We are so grateful you were able to join us. Thank you again to Liz, Jeff, Mick, Donna, and everyone who participated in our discussion. We'd love to stay in touch with you. So if you haven't already, please visit spacesmag.com and sign up for our Spaces e-newsletter. We will send out a recording of this event soon, along with resources you'll need to stay connected with us and our speakers. And if you're watching this as a recording on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. We upload new content regularly. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care.